Well, all the students can be dismissed with Miss Katie right now. She's going to take them back. So if you are a student, and let me say this, at the end of the service, we are going to pray for our administrators and principals and teachers and bus drivers. And if you fall into those categories, we're going to have you come down front at the end of the service, and we're going to pray over you as we launch into a new school year. And so speaking of new school years, while people are heading out, let me just uh, get you to speak to the people around you. And I want you to share with maybe those who are sitting beside you uh, one of your favorite or most memorable school moments. I don't know about you, but I, I loved waking up and going. Well, I didn't love waking up, but I, I did love going to school. Uh, but I, I, I remember when I was younger uh, thinking just five more minutes in bed. Just five more minutes, right? So share with somebody around you something that you remember from school as our children are being dismissed. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that I, uh, that I also remember about school was just the excitement of getting new things. You know, you get new notebooks or trapper keepers or book bags or lunch boxes, right? Uh, that's always new, uh, a fun when you're getting something new. But, but then, you know, you, you go into a school and, and you meet new teachers or maybe you're making new friends or you have a new schedule. There's a whole new routine and uh, there's just something about newness, isn't there? Um, and even though school sometimes can be uh, dreadful for us or we can feel like, oh, you know, I just I can't wait till school is over or out. There is something to be said about learning and about growing. And uh, those of us who've been out of school for a while now understand this, that you never you never stop learning, do you? You never stop growing. And and uh, in fact, this morning, I was reminded during our prayer time that that the only thing that doesn't grow is something that's dead. I want you to think about that. And even, even dead things decompose. <laughs> There's still movement, right? And, and so I want you to think about this, that, that because you're alive, you should be excited that God has given you one more day, that God is allowing you to grow and learn, and that we as a church... Right, we've got some awesome things going on. If you haven't seen in the back, there's some great renovations going on because we've had so many children coming through the church here lately, we need to expand. That's a very good thing. And I'm telling you, thank you, Freddie and Dennis, especially, for all the work they've been doing this week. But, but you know, that's not it. It's not going to stop there. Amen? It's not going to stop there. We want to keep growing. We want to keep moving. And in order for that to happen, we ourselves have got to be growing. So, so you, you guys remember this, right? Your children probably on your doors, right? You, you have those little marks. Maybe it's a closet door. Maybe it's a kitchen door. But you have that mark, you know, and here it is on this date of how tall they were. And what do they want to do? They come back the next day. Let me see if I grow, grew any last night, right? It's like, no, you didn't grow any last night, but, but, but let's try it, you know, in a week's time or, or maybe a month's time, and let's see. And sometimes it's hard to measure our growth. But, but let me assure you, you're growing. Let me assure you that, that God is working in your life, that God is doing things, because our God is a God of movement. Our God is a God who is always doing something new. And today we're going to spend some time in Psalm chapter 37. And uh, if I had to give this a subtitle, it would be this. How do we live as Christians in this culture? How can we live as Christians in this current climate? How, how can we do a better job of representing Christ where we are? And, 
And this message has kind of been percolating in my, my mind over the last few weeks. Um, this is one of the reasons I encourage you to spend time with God daily, uh, because this message actually uh, grew out of a quiet time I was having. And, and I do. I, I seek to spend time with the Lord every day. And I do a lot of journaling, do a lot of writing, and um, this is some of the thoughts that came from that. So let's look at it. Do not fret, in verse number one, because of evildoers. Be envious not toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herbs. I wish my grass would fade quickly. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, we're going to talk about that because a lot of people want to claim that verse, you know. Just, just delight yourself in the Lord and he's going to give you the desires of your heart, everything you want. Well, I don't know that, that verse is saying that. It goes on and says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evildoers. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Now, Whenever you do a Bible study or you're reading through the scriptures, sometimes you're going to see like certain patterns or there are going to be certain words that kind of stick out. And as I was looking at this, I, I thought it was interesting that he kept talking about these evildoers, these wrongdoers. And, and he says a couple of times, he says, don't fret, don't fret. Now, that's kind of an old word. We don't use that all the time, right? So let me put it in modern language. Don't stress. Don't get worked up. Don't worry about it. And so this is what he's saying. He's saying, quit paying so much attention to the people who are doing evil and thinking that everything's going right for them, nothing's going right for me. How often do we think that, right? It's like, let me ask you, what has gotten you all worried and anxious today? What's gotten you all bent out of shape that you're looking at everybody else around you and you're saying, why is it that I'm following Jesus and it seems like everything's going wrong? Let me tell you one of the reasons why. It's because you got an enemy, right? And he's not going to make life easy for you. Think about it. Think about it. If you have the most powerful enemy in the world and he is disrupting your life, do you think it's going to be easy? And, and so often we get this wrong mentality of, oh, well, following Jesus means everything's going to be, you know, roses. It's not. In fact, Jesus wore the crown of thorns. So what we've got to be aware of is this, is that when I choose to actually follow Jesus in this world, there's going to be trials and tribulations. But Jesus said this, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Don't be envious or stressed out when everybody else who's doing evil seems like they're prospering because that prospering is short-lived. Their, their success is short-lived. Do not fret because of the evildoers. Don't get worked up when all of this stuff seems to persist. And you feel like, well, what can I do as a believer? What can I do as a follower of God? I mean, it seems like everyone else is succeeding. The wicked are succeeding. Don't let the way of the world and those of the world that seem to be advanced and worry you or cause you to be envious. He says, don't be envious of their success. Sometimes we look at other people and we compare what we've got against somebody else. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm older now. And uh, I, only, only in the last few years have I owned a house. Only in the last few years have I owned a car that wasn't breaking down every five minutes. And there were people who were looking at me saying, wow, look at what you've got. I'm like, do you, know, do you realize how long it's taken me to get here? Do you, do you realize? And I, I mean, maybe it's because I hang out with students a lot. People think I'm a lot younger. And they think, oh, well, you just got that. I didn't just get that. And many of us who are older, you know, you, you may own your house now. And you realize this. You didn't just get that overnight. 
You worked for it. And this is one of the problems with our society today is that everybody feels like, well, they deserve something yesterday. And you don't get it yesterday. Did you put your time in yesterday? Did you put your last 20 years in? No, you haven't. So, so quit being envious when all these people are doing evil. Seems like they're getting what they want. Because let me ask you this. Maybe you want the wrong thing. Maybe you want the wrong thing. Thing. So all these are going to kind of start with D. Uh, define your terms. What is it that you want? What do you want out of this life? What are you looking for out of this world? If you want success, I need to tell you this, that success as a Christian is defined differently than what the world says success is. As a Christian, this is the, this is the definition. It's obedience to what the Lord's will is. That's success. And that means that each one of us can obtain success as a follower of Jesus. You can. Unfortunately, we are distracted by the success of everyone else because we think that that's what matters. And that's not what matters. It's easy for us to say that, isn't it? It's easy for us to say that that's not what matters. And yet, what do we do? We spend so much time working for all of this stuff that doesn't matter. All of this stuff that's going to cause us headaches and heartaches. And yet, we could have success today by simply being obedient to the Lord. Remember that what looks like losing is actually winning. You need to remember that as a follower of Jesus. If you're going to succeed in this world, you need to remember that it's going to look like you're losing. It's going to look like you're getting nowhere. It's going to look like you take one step back and ten steps backward. I mean, one step forward, ten steps backward. It's going to feel like that sometimes. Because this world and the world system is not geared towards a Christian success. You're going to have to fight for it. If you want to be successful in Jesus' eyes. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 25. He said this, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Are you willing to, to lose some things for the Lord? Are you willing to change your paradigm and, your, and, and, and focus on something different? Something that's actually going to last forever? Are you willing to do that? Because Jesus spoke about this several times. Mark 8, 35, Luke 9, 24, Luke 17, 33, John 12, 25. Jesus says the same things. You're going to lose in this world if you're going to win in the next one. one of the, uh, I was listening to a song earlier uh, this week, and uh, there's a line in it that I love. It's, it's from Psalm 46 by Shane and Shane. And, and he says this, he's talking about wrestling with God, and he says, wrestle us, right? He says, engage us, that's our word for this year, engage us, wrestle us, and win. Let me tell you this, if you wrestle God, God's going to win. And, and this is how you win, you win when he wins. That, that if you will wrestle God and you will let him pin you, you win. But it's going to feel like losing. Are you willing to lose? Are you, are you willing to engage God? Are you willing to actually redefine your terms? You see, perception is not reality. We all know this. We all know this. Perception is not reality, and yet we can be so easily fooled. We can be so easily lured into believing that what we're fighting for really matters. And I have to ask you, you've got to evaluate this often. Is what you're fighting for what really matters? We tend to make a big deal out of nothing. You, you heard this phrase before, don't make a, a, a mountain out of a molehill, right? And some of us have been doing that. Some of us have been amassing all this stuff, right? And it's just all going to be gone one day, right? 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. Actually, I think it's chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. Do not love the world, nor, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So... What John is telling us, and John is known as the apostle that Jesus loved, not because he was more loved than somebody else, but 
Perhaps because he understood how much he was loved. That, that because he understood that Jesus loved him, that God loved him so much, he was able to say this, nothing else matters. All this stuff that I see and the success of everyone else around me, you know what? That doesn't matter. So I'm not going to be envious about these things. I'm not going to be worried or stressed out whenever it seems like the world system is succeeding. Because I know who loves me. I know why I'm here. And that is to honor and worship him. And so it is possible for a Christian to do that. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, look at this. Therefore, if, any, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking. Because that's where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you have died... And your life is hidden with Christ and God. That means this, that when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we say that I am pursuing you. I'm chasing after you. And yet it's so easy to get distracted, isn't it? It's so easy to get distracted. This is one of the things that I think is kind of dangerous about self-driving cars. I don't know if you have a self-driving car, but if you do, uh, good for you. But, but, but this is what I'm going to say. The tendency in our lives, is to get us to a place where we have to do nothing. And I think that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous when we're, we're moving everything we can to where we don't have to think, we don't have to interact, we don't have to do anything except just be entertained. And I think that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous when we're switching our brains off and we're letting something else think for us. Wait, uh, look... Self-driving cars, I understand. I, I can see how it can benefit some things. But I'm telling you this. I love driving my car. And this is one of the reasons I've got a stick that's got a Spider-Man gear shifter on it. <laughs> I couldn't resist. It was $4.99 from Ross. So. But this is the thing about it, right? Is that the thing about a stick shift is you got to be more engaged. you got to pay attention. It's not just one leg, one hand doing all the work. i got two legs working. Praise God for that. We're getting back, getting back, right? i got, I got two hands working. i got two eyes working. i got to pay attention to a lot more things because this car is not going to drive itself. i got to drive it. And this is what's happening in life is that some of us are looking for our lives to just be on autopilot or we want somebody else to think for us or we want somebody else to drive for us or we want somebody else to you know, take care of us spiritually and you've got to understand you've got to engage if you want to grow. You've got to plug in if you want to grow. Don't be envious when everything else seems to be working for somebody else and it seems like it's so easy. And you feel like you got to work hard at it. Some of you probably had siblings, you know, and you, you got your brothers and sisters, and it seemed like math was just a breeze for them, and you're sitting there for hours laboring over two plus two. <laughs> right? Why is it so easy for them? I don't get it. I can't figure this out. That's how I felt with geometry. It, I didn't take it twice because I loved it. I took it twice because I hated it. Right? And I almost failed it the second time, even with the same teacher. I did fail statistics twice, and that's when I changed my major. <laughs> but you see, there's some things that just don't click, and, it, and it's like, you know, you've got to work, and you're going to have to study, you're going to have to work out, work out what you believe. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, right? we got to redefine or define our terms. What is it you're looking for in life? Number two, depend on the Lord. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. Whenever everything's not going our way, you know what? It's really hard to want to do good, isn't it? Whenever everything, you feel like, man, I'm trying and I'm trying. Am I the only one who's doing good out here? Am I the only one that's going to hold the door anymore? Well, if you are, keep holding it. If you're the only one that's going to say thank you, keep saying it. If you're the only one who's going to be kind, keep being kind. 
Because this is one of the ways that God is saying the world's going to know that He exists. Is that there's still some good in the world. But that also means you're going to have to depend on the Lord. Because you're not always going to get the encouragement from somebody else. Everybody's not always going to notice when you say, yes ma'am, no ma'am. That was one of the things for me growing up, right? In, in our house, I grew up with my grandparents. They didn't make me say yes ma'am, no ma'am to them. But they made sure I said it to somebody else. Right? And, and so, what we need to understand is this. Is that we all know the good things we should do. We just don't always do it. You know. Many of you have been Christians for a long time. It's not like, you know, some of the stuff that I'm telling you is, is brand new to you. You know the good, so just do it. But the reason we don't do it is because we feel like, oh, you know, what's the use? It's so old-fashioned. It's, it's just so archaic. Why should I do that? I, I want to draw your attention to, if, in your scriptures, the word LORD is in all caps. All caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You know what that means? That means Yahweh. That means the Lord God. The only Lord God. So it says this, you need to depend on Yahweh. The one who is the sustainer. The one who is the giver of all good things. This is the one we say we worship. And if we worship that God, the God who is the all-sufficient one, the God who is our great provider, the God who is our peace in the midst of the storms, that is the God we're talking about. And yet some of us act like he doesn't exist. And so he says, depend on the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, because that's the God you serve. You know what? Sometimes oh, God may allow us to be in the deep end of the pool. Some of you, you're learning to swim. Your parents are like, okay, let's move out to the deep end, and you're so scared. No, don't let me go to the deep end of the pool. They're like, you've got to go to the deep end of the pool. You've got to learn how to float. You've got to learn how to paddle. You've got to do that. You can't do that in the shallow end. You get hurt in the shallow end, you stay there trying to kick, trying to swim. You get hurt in the shallow end. You got to go to the deep end. And sometimes God is trying to push us to the deeper end of the pool, not because he's mean, not because he doesn't care, but because he wants you to learn how to truly trust. So, you got to go swimming in the deep end of the pool. Some of you may feel like you're in over your head right now. You may feel like, wow, you know, this is just way too much water and my arms are getting really tired from treading, right? But if you are in over your head, if you are swimming in the deep end of the pool, let me just remind you that you may be in the deep end of the, end of the pool so that you will learn to depend on God. It's in the deep end where you learn to depend on God. And so God is trying to get you to a deeper relationship with him. He's trying to move you to a deeper place so that you will not depend on yourself, so that you won't depend on your version of success, but that you will realize that obedience to him is where you learn true dependence, where you learn true faith. So many of us want to say we've got faith, we're in that pool, and we're still standing there on the side. We're moving our arms, but we're standing up. You ain't, you ain't tricking nobody. Come on, move to the deep end of the pool. Your dependence on him is revealed by you continuing to do good even when evil persists. You see... It's in the deep end of the pool that we have to say, yes, God, I am trusting you. I'm out here trusting you, and I might be all by myself, but I'm going to keep trusting you because this is where you told me to go, and this is where I'm going to be. And I believe that even if I'm going down, you know what? I've got a lifeguard. I've got a lifeguard, and he's watching. He's paying attention, and, and my lifeguard is strong, and, and he will not let me go down. 
And so I'm going to keep doing good. Earlier I alluded to this. Why am I the only one, right? You feel like, well, why am I the only one out here? You know, we're just finishing up Shark Week. Just finishing up Shark Week. I didn't get to watch any of it. I, I forgot it was, it was happening, but... But I did see some advertisement for it last night, right? And I'm just thinking about, you know, how crazy is it, right? Everybody, everybody's talking about shark week, shark week, shark, and it's like sharks are dangerous. I, it's like my dad's a shark hunter. I know these things, right? You don't, you don't, you don't play around with sharks. And you, you definitely, if you're going to go swimming with the sharks, you better be prepared to die, right? And this is what we got to, we got to understand. There's some sharks out there. And the Lord, he said this. He said, I'm sending you as sheep to the wolves. It's dangerous out there. But you can survive. You can do more than survive. You can actually thrive. But you're only going to thrive when your dependence comes from him. Remember Elijah? When he had just called down fire from, from heaven and it destroys like all of the, the sacrifices and burns up, you know, the other, the, the prophets of Baal, they've been there for hours laboring, you know, just praying to their God and cutting themselves, it says, it, that, that they're just doing all of this stuff. And Elijah does this incredible miracle. God shows up. And then a few moments later, it seems like a few moments later, he hears Jezebel wants to kill him. And he goes running for his life. He, he has just experienced a mountaintop experience. He's just had this incredible showing of God's power. And now he's like, oh no, there's this crazy queen that wants to kill me. I'm going to run for my life. Elijah. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, man. Did you forget? How could you forget? It's only been like three verses. <laughs> I mean, come on. And he runs for his life, and God says this, Hey, Elijah, man, I know you're tired. You, you just spent all this you know, spiritual energy and all this kind of stuff's going on, so, so go get some rest, go, get, go eat, and I'm going to provide for you and go up into this cave, and he's going to rest there. And Look at this, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I think God asks this question, and it's somewhat rhetorical, right? What are you doing here, Elijah? Did you forget your dependence is on me? Did you forget uh, all that just happened? Just like a page ago, you forgot? Did you, how, how could you forget? And look at what he says. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord. The God of hosts, and the, the God of hosts there means the God of, of the heavenly host, okay, the God of angels. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And look at what he says, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah said, I'm the only one. I'm the only one out here doing good. I'm the only one out here, you know, who's speaking for the Lord. I'm the only one. Out. You ever felt like that? That you're the only one? And you're the only one who's trying to do what's right. You're the only one who's got any convictions in your family. You're the only one who seems like you're chasing after the Lord. And it's like, man, you raised your kids, right? And, and where, why aren't they following the Lord? I don't know. You feel like you're the only one? And look at this. God says, Elijah, you don't know what you're talking about. Get some rest, man. Get some rest. Eat. And God speaks to him. Verse number 19, I think it is. He says, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God said, Elijah, you're not the only one. I've got 7,000 other prophets over here. You just don't know about them. And church, I need to remind you that when you think life is tough for you, you need to be reminded that there are literally millions, if not billions, around the world who are suffering much greater hardship than we are. And there are people today whose lives are literally on the line, so you are not the only one. We would do well to pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted around the world. 
So depend on the Lord and keep doing good. It says that very plain and simple. Trust in the Lord and do good. You want to know how to, how to change our world? It's not going to change overnight, but it can change in your job. It can change in your community. It can change in your school when you choose to keep trusting God and doing good. Keep trusting God and doing good. Doesn't matter whether the administration acknowledges it. Doesn't matter whether your boss acknowledges it. Doesn't matter whether you get a raise. It doesn't matter. Because they're not your boss. So many of us are working for the wrong boss. You're working for a paycheck. Let me tell you, <laughs> the paycheck's going to come and go. Most of it's already went before it came, right? But God is faithful. And when you trust him and you keep doing good, God is no debtor to man. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So let's move on to the next D, dwell in the land. Dwell in the land. So many of us praying, oh, man, I can't wait till Jesus comes back, takes me away. And yet, God says, well, while you're here, do some good. Don't just be looking to get out. So many people looking to get out. How many times we, right, we, we, we heard this, right? Man, that job looks so much better than mine. You got it so much better than I do. And Irma Bombeck said this. She said, grass is greener on the other side. You just didn't realize the other side is where the septic tank is. <laughs> right? It might be greener on the other side, but you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what's underneath. And so often we can be looking with the wrong perspective saying, wow, the grass is so much greener over there or I can't wait to get to heaven. Listen, if you have a hard time living for Jesus now, you're going to have a harder time living for Jesus when he's the one in complete control. Right? You ever heard this before? You ain't from around here. <laughs> I wonder if anybody would say that about you as a follower of Jesus. You ain't from around here, are you? People ought to be saying that about you because of all the good they see. That, that you're not doing things the way that everybody else is doing. Oh, you ain't from around here, are you? I've had that said about me a few times. When I grew up on the East Coast, we have some phrases there that may not be familiar to you. One of those phrases, and I'm going to give you a few of them here, is like, I done been momicked. Y'all ever heard that before? You done, I done been momicked. Momicked means annoyed, driven to craziness, right? I've been momicked all day. How about this? Go and put it in the icebox. Put it in the icebox. Uh, growing up, that's what we used to call the refrigerator. Or I call it the refrigerator. I don't, I don't say the roof. Right? You've been wearing them high tiders. Y'all know what high tiders are? That's when your pants like come up here like this. Right? It's, it's, it's getting popular now, you know. We're bringing it back. Right? How about this? We're going over yonder. Some of y'all might have heard that before, right? Going over yonder. How about you got a toboggan? Y'all know what a toboggan is? I'm not talking about a sled. I'm talking about a hat, right? We call it a toboggan. Or how about this? We fixing to. <laughs> when are you going to do that? Oh, we fixing to. Fixing to means like, you know, three weeks later. <laughs> but we fixing to. You see, it's, it's not about, some of these phrases are kind of lost on you. And, and if you listen to, and you can go on YouTube and you can, you know, search like uh, Down East Brogue, and you will see that sometimes, I mean, even when my, my dad calls, you know, he's got a, a strong brogue, and it's hard for me to understand what he's saying because he's from Down East. And some of these words, some of these phrases that they talk about are things that are kind of lost on us because we ain't from around there. But they know what they're talking about. And for us as Christians, because we ain't from here, we should be talking about some things that kind of set us apart. And people would look at us and say, well, wow, you're, you're different. And yeah, not just, you, you don't just talk different. You actually act different. You do things different. You see, one of the things that we don't understand, and, and I don't know why we don't understand it, but, you know, my mom is Korean. And when she came here to the United States, she didn't stop using chopsticks. She's been in America for 50-some years. And you know what? She still uses chopsticks. 
Her culture didn't change just because her location changed. And some of us, even though we're Christians, you know what? We've adopted more of the culture around us than changed the culture. We, we've just brought in everything and said, oh, you know, I'm not from there. I'm from here. Or you may not be from here, but nobody would know that. Because you look like the people from here. You talk like the people from here. You've adopted every practice that everybody does from here. So why would anybody think you're not from here? It's not a matter of where we are. It's a matter of, of where we're from. And we are not from here. Our home is not here. The way we live ought to point people that we ain't from around here. Would anybody look at some of the things that you do and just say, wow, you know, you're just not like us. So many of us spend our whole lives trying to fit in, trying to look like everybody else. We, we, we just want to be accepted by everybody else. And yet, Jesus is saying this, I accepted you as you are, but I don't want you to stay that way. I want you to live differently. I want you to be different. 1 Peter 2, 10 through 12. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior. Look at this. Keep your behavior, not your beliefs. Your beliefs should form your behavior. And this is one of the things that we need to understand is that if we're behaving a certain way, then that shows what we believe. Check your behavior because it shows what everybody you believe. Keep your behavior excellent. Look at this. Among the Gentiles. You know who the Gentiles were? Everybody who was not a Jew. That means everybody who was not a follower of Jesus. Keep your behavior. Look at this. Excellent. You ought to be the best worker wherever you are. You ought to be the best employee wherever you are. You ought to do whatever you do, even if it's not required of you, as unto the Lord. You ought to be doing that because you are to keep your behavior. Look at this, not so-so. Oh, you know, everybody does it. Everybody, everybody does like that. Is that excellence? Are you giving your best? Or are you just doing enough to get by? I'm telling you, I, I'm getting frustrated with some of our drive through workers these days. <laughs> right? And I'm just like, how hard is it, man? Just give me the straw in the bag. You forgot the straw. Right? Napkins. Yes. My packet of ketchup. Where's, where's my ketchup? I asked for it. Right? It's like, I ordered this. You showed it up on the screen, right? It says, it says you, did, did, I, did you record my order? Yes, you recorded it correctly. Please fulfill it correctly. And so what, what's happening is this, is that we now live in a society where it's like, oh, it's not a big deal. You, yeah, oh, you, you ordered it with no pickles? Oh, sorry, we put pickles on there, but you can take it off. Mm. I, I can, but I asked for it not to be put on, right? Oh, well, we don't even make the burger. Somebody else made the burger. Yeah, I was like, look, man, Right? And I'm just saying, you know, this, this, uh, this could be picky, but, but, but let's, let's understand this. We are supposed to be living with excellence. And if anybody should be inspecting the way that we live, it's not somebody else. We should be inspecting our own lives and saying like, look, I expect more out of me. I expect more than you expect out of me. Quit feeling like you're just going to be average Joe. I don't think anybody here is named Joe. Because Joe's not average, and you don't need to be either. He says, so keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing which they slander you, look at this, that the world is actually going to start calling you an evildoer. Ironic, isn't it? Psalm 37 is all about the evildoers and those who are wrongdoers, and all of a sudden they're going to turn it on you, and they're going to start saying, oh, you're the one who's doing evil. And look at what it says. So when they slander you as evildoers... They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, 
glorify God in the day of his visitation. That you take away the fire whenever you keep doing good. It's important to remember that the dwelling places are not permanent places. You dwell in the land, but this is not where you're going to stay. Don't get so earthly-minded that you're no heavenly good. Don't get so tethered to this world that God can't use you for the other one. Don't get so tied up in all these earthly affairs and all these things that really don't matter that we can spend so much time and energy defending and fighting for, and yet we can't seem to fight for the truth. We can't seem to fight and defend Christ. Trust in the Lord and do good. i got to keep moving. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I want to talk about developing faithfulness. Cultivate. He says, cultivate faithfulness. I chose that translation for that word, cultivate. It's a farming word. It means you got to develop it. You got to grow it. You got to grow what? What's the word he says? Cultivate what? Faithfulness. So you know what that, that, that leads me to believe? That leads me to believe that faithfulness is going to take work. It, it leads me to believe that faithfulness is actually going to take time. That, that faithfulness is not something that just happens overnight. That actually faithfulness may take some fertilizer. That, that faithfulness may require me to show something, to make some effort. You see, faith is expressed in a moment, but faithfulness takes time. You can express your faith just like that, but to be faithful is going to take some time. So many of us, look, you're not going to be, you, you can't say, oh, I was faithful, you know, for an hour. Is that going to endear trust? Oh, you, you kept a promise for an hour? Oh, good, good on you. Can you keep that same promise for a year? Can you keep that same promise for 10 years? Uh, that's how we'll know you've been faithful. You see, faithfulness isn't measured in just a moment. It actually requires two things. Let me give those to you. Preparation is one. Preparation. If you're going to cultivate something, you know what? You've got to prepare the land. You've got to get out there and, and you've got to remove some weeds. You've got to remove some rocks. And some of us who want to be faithful to the Lord, you need to start here. Start removing some junk. Get some things out of your life. Clear the land. Get rid of the rocks. Get rid of the weeds. Make the land ready. And this is what we've been trying to do over the last few years, right? Y'all remember our word was ready just last year. But to get there, we have to prepare some things. And for you to get to the next place in your life, wherever it may be that God is calling you to get to, you need to prepare the land. God may be, may be tilling your soil. He might be stretching your faith. How is God turning up the land? How is he turning up things in your life? You say, oh, I don't like this. You know, I don't want to deal with this. Listen, if you don't deal with it, you're never going to grow. You don't, you don't deal with it. It's never going to go away. It's never going to change. You're going to have to confront some of these things. You've got to prepare the land. And the next P is this. The second one is you've got to perspire. <laughs> you've got to perspire. It's not just preparation. It's perspiration. For you ladies, it's glistening. You're going to have to glisten. You're going to have to glisten. All right? And I know, I know. Right? We don't like to get out and sweat, but there are some things that will not happen without a little bit of sweat. In fact, that's part of the curse, right? Some of you ladies are like, that was, that was the ground, that was Adam, that wasn't me. Look at what it says. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken. You, were, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So yes, God was talking specifically to Adam in this time, 
But you know what? All of us have to practice tilling the soil. All of us have to practice personal gardening. All of us have to practice weeding out some things in our lives, removing some stones from our lives. All of us need to practice this, and it's not going to happen without some preparation and without some perspiration. We are living here to show our dependence on the Lord and by developing our faithfulness in serving others. We are here not to just say, I'm going to be faithful to this one task. No, I'm going to be faithful in all tasks. I'm going to be excellent in everything I do. I'm going to hold myself to a higher standard than what everybody else is holding themselves to. And you know what? I'm not going to be judgmental of anybody. I'm, I'm going to be the harshest judge on myself. Because whatever judgment you exercise towards someone else is the same judgment the Lord is going to exercise on you. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. Let's look at that, the next D. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight. Let me ask you, what is your delight these days? Where do you find great joy? In what are you trusting for happiness? You see, if your delight depends on someone else, then you need to expect to be depressed most of your life. If your delight rests on someone else, if it depends on someone else, then you're going to be depressed most of your life. This is why he says, delight yourself in the Lord. Even coming to church, you know what? We can, we can come to church and say, oh, you know, here I'm going to get some encouragement, or here I'm going to, I'm going to find some joy. Listen to this. He says, delight yourself. Your joy doesn't rest on someone else. So you can choose joy. In fact, happiness is rooted in happenings. And that's why it can be so easily uprooted. However, joy is rooted in Christ. And that's why it's always secure. Joy is the second fruit of the Spirit. And when we understand how we are loved, there is inexpressible joy. You see, a lot of people just want to hang out there, right? And they say the fruit of the Spirit is love. And I'm just going to camp here. No. The fruit of the Spirit is many things. It starts with love, but it progresses to many things, to joy and peace. And so let me, let me say this, that you can have joy. You can have joy if you're willing to delight yourself in the Lord. So many of us don't have joy because we're delighting in something else. And, and those things are never going to bring us joy. It's always going to leave you empty. Do your desires stem from Christ or somewhere else? Ask yourself that hard question. Why do I desire this? Is this desire a godly desire? Or is it a fleshly desire? Is, is this something that God would want for me? Or is this something that God says, no, you know, that's not good for you? And then you have to ask yourself, well, why do I want it then? Why do I want it? Well, we have a sinful nature. So what am I going to do about that? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, when you desire Christ, then the desires that he has will become your desires. And he will grant those desires because they're his desires. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? But it says this, that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he's going to give you the desires of your heart because your heart is actually for him. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? That, that we, we so often, we, we, we don't see his face. You know why you're not seeing his face? Because you're just seeking his hands. But if, but if you start seeking his face, and he becomes your one desire, he's all that you want, then all of a sudden, God gives you what you want, which is ultimately himself. There's nothing greater than God himself, is there? If you're struggling with having the right desires, let me give you two things to do as I wrap up. The first one is this. You're going to have to discipline them. Every desire does not come from God. You know that. Every thought that comes in your head doesn't come from God. 
Sometimes I have thoughts that come into my head. I'm like, where did that come from? You know where it came from, from the pit. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to discipline your thoughts. That means this, you don't dwell on it, you flush it, right? There are some things that you don't need to dwell on, you just need to get rid of it. You don't need to spend any time thinking about it. You don't even need to ask yourself a lot of questions. You know, why am I thinking that way? Don't even, think, don't even ask yourself that question. Just realize and recognize where it came from and send it back. Return to sender, right? Return to sender. But have nothing to do with the worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Many of us don't have a problem disciplining ourselves for the purpose of looking good. We don't have a problem disciplining ourselves so that we can have time off. We don't have a problem with disciplining ourselves so that we can be more healthy. How about disciplining ourselves so that we can be more godly? Is that on the top of anybody's list, right? It's like, when, when was the last time you said, you know, this whole year, I'm just going to focus on godliness. I'm going to focus on being holy. <laughs> I can't even say the word holy, right? We're so scared of, of, of saying and being different. And yet, I'm telling you this, if you start pursuing godliness, you start pursuing holiness, you're going to find out a whole lot of stuff about yourself and about the people around you. Because everybody else is not going to be on the bandwagon for you pursuing holiness, Everybody else is not going to be on the bandwagon for you pursuing godliness because they're going to say, oh, come on, what's the big deal? What's wrong with that? Oh, there's nothing wrong with it for you. But for me, I'm going to live a different life. For me, I, I'm, I'm going to live an excellent life because I serve a risen Savior and He's in the world today, right? He's walking with me, right? He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. So, discipline yourself for godliness, for bodily discipline is only of, of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life. Look at this. For the present life, where you're dwelling, it has promise for this life. But not only for this life, for the next one too. Do, not, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. You know, I thought this is always kind of crazy, right? We all know that in a race, a lot of people are going to win. Listen, if, if, and I know Daniel does a lot of, you know, tough man competition and stuff. I envy that, that ability. And, and I'm telling you this. If we were to go outside, and he's not been doing any training right now, but, but if we were to go outside, he's still going to beat me in a race. But you know what? If he challenged me to run, I'm going to run, even with my leg messed up, right? Even though I know he's going to win, I'm still going to run. And that's what he's saying here. He's like, look, everybody's not going to win, but you know what? We're all in the race. So run to win. Some of you are just like, oh, I don't even want to go. You know, I ain't going to win. I don't even want to participate. No, uh-uh. He says this, do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you can win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Y'all need to circle that. Self-control in all things. Self-control in all things. That means at the buffet too. Right? Uh, we're not going to talk about gluttony right now, but, but that's exercising self-control in all things. That means binge watching, self-control in all things. That means whatever it is, right, where there's no self-control, you need to practice self-control there if you're a follower of Jesus. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it a slave to myself so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So discipline those desires. You can control them. I know sometimes you feel like, oh man, you know, this is too much for me to control. You know, the Bible says this, there's no temptation that has taken you, but such is common to man, but that God will not, he will provide a way for you to escape. So when there's a temptation, when there's a desire that's flaring up in you and you feel like, oh, it's just too much, you know what? The Holy Spirit says, get out. Get out. Don't stay there. Change the scenery. Move along. 
Get out of there. Discipline yourself to take the fire escape. And then you got to develop them. You see, you can develop godly desires. You can develop new habits. You can do that. But you're going to have to make the effort to do that. You're going to have to learn how to use a spoon or a fork, right? When we're children, our parents are there, you know, open line. But at some point, you know what? You want to take the spoon yourself and start eating yourself. Because that's what you do to show you're mature. That's what you do to, to start growing. And so you can develop new habits. You can develop new skills. You can develop them. You can develop new tastes. Some of you think, oh, you know, well, this uh, it tastes so good. I, and look, I've never drank beer. I don't know what it tastes like. But a lot of people tell me that it's an acquired taste. It's an acquired taste. But for some reason, what doesn't taste good at first, because you keep tasting it, it tastes good after a while. Is that right? No? Maybe? No? Maybe people just keep drinking it? Some people. You can. You can. But here's the thing. Even if it doesn't taste good, you still develop a habit of drinking it, right? Maybe that's a bad illustration. So let's talk about the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And here's the point, is that some of you may feel like, oh, you know, a church is boring. How many of us said that in times past? Look, I work hard to make church not boring. I work hard at it. Try not to have a boring church service. But let's be honest. Sometimes things are going to be boring. Sometimes things are going to be said that aren't going to feel good, not going to make us happy. But you know what? You realize it's good for you. I didn't really eat a lot of asparagus growing up. It is an acquired taste. <laughs> but you know what? My brother made some a couple, couple years ago, and he threw it in the, in the, on the grill with some olive oil, salt and pepper, a little bit of rosemary. And when he ate, when he served it to me, I ate it all up. And I said, man, I got to learn how to make that. Right? Because that was good. And when I tasted, I said, man, I can acquire a taste for this. You see, so many of us feel like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I want to try that. I, I don't know. You know, it's so different. And, and, and there are some things, you know, that, that it, it may require an acquired taste. But if you will taste it, right? How many times have we heard this from our parents? Oh, it's good for you. It's good for you. My mom still says that to me today. There are some things I don't want to eat. And she's like, well, it's good for you. She says this a lot, too, and I laugh. She's like, well, you know, it'll make your hair shiny. <laughs> I'm like, mom, you see, I don't need that now, right? But if we would just taste and see, the Lord is always good. He is always good. And so commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. Look at that. He's talking to Christians here. He says, do not fret. Why? Because it only leads to you doing evil. It leads to evil doing when you start fretting, when you start worrying, when you start getting anxious, when you start paying more attention to what you feel like is success of someone else instead of your obedience to the Lord. It leads to evil doing. So finally, decide to commit. Decide to commit. The band, you guys can come on up. Decide to commit. There's a track star who was running a race, and at the end of the race, he did really well, and they were interviewing him, and they said, hey, you know, we see your mouth kind of mumbling, moving while you're running. He's like, what are you, what are you doing? And he said, well, actually, I'm kind of praying. And he said, this is what I'm saying. Lord, you pick them up, and I'll put them down. Lord, you pick them up, I'll put them down. Lord, you pick them up, I'll put them down. 
And he is committed to running that race. But he was committed to doing his part. Because when we do our part, the Lord will do his part. When we do what is natural, God will do what is supernatural. When we do what he's called us to do, right, he will bless it. Your commitment will be demonstrated by you resting patiently in the Lord. When you commit to the Lord and you depend on him and you trust him for all things and you keep doing good in the land and you allow God to develop you, you will see that he is good. I want you to know that a commitment, deciding to commit, is a serious word. It's a promise that you do not ever intend to break. In our society today, we've kind of taken commitment lightly. We, we, we take promises lightly. And so I want to call us all to renew our commitment to the Lord. But understand this, that a commitment is something that you don't intend to break. In fact, Ecclesiastes says this, don't make a promise and then break it. Don't make a vow and then not keep it. That if you have promised the Lord certain things, you need to follow through. You need to do it because it's a serious word. A commitment is, is a serious word. It's a promise that you're going to make every effort to keep. Those of you who are married, you know what? You, you make every effort for that marriage to succeed. If you're not making every effort, then I have to question your commitment. Because you can't say you're, you're committed if you're not making every effort. Are you committed to your job? Are you making every effort to do your job well? All right, all right, you're committed to the church, right? You're committed to God. Are you making every effort to serve him well? You see, a commitment is a serious word, and if it's a promise that you're going to allow to influence every other decision. You see, your commitment to your spouse, you know what? Because that's a serious commitment, that commitment influences every other decision you make. It influences what you say yes to, and it influences what you say no to. And the same thing is true for our commitment to God. That if we are saying, I am committed to you, God, then you know what? That decision influences everything else I do in this world. It influences how I define success. And so that means there's no excuses. I'm not going to make excuses. No loopholes. I'm not looking for some way to kind of get by. I'm not looking for something that I can kind of slip through on. No. No slacking. No way. So church, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to engage? Because you see, God has left us here to dwell in the land, but cultivate faithfulness. And if we are willing to do that, we can make a difference. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would help us to delight ourselves in you. And that you would give us the desires of our heart. And may our hearts desire only you. May we allow you to define what success is. May we not become envious of evildoers knowing that it will lead us to do evil as well. But may our hope and our trust be found in Christ alone. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.